Hello and welcome everyone, this is Kalebovich, coming to you with the first episode of Deck Check. And in this series I'm gonna do more detailed analysis of some of the decks I have made or been playing. And today, as the first video of the series, as the first deck of the series, I'm giving you my so-called Xenon Millrange deck. Yes, Millrange, that's a strange name and it consists of two parts, Mill and Range, and it rhymes with Midrange, so honestly, Mill and Midrange. So this is a Xenon, i.e. Time plus Shadow deck, that has a two-pronged assault on the opponent. The first, more obvious one, is being a midrange deck, meaning a deck with um, more than 15, more than 20 units uh, that are usually played on curve from turn two onward, uh, that are that usually tend to be bigger than the opponent's units or more versatile. Uh, so just the best units uh, out there. The other pronged assault that some people might not be aware of is the mill portion of the name and of the deck and of the attack. So milling the opponent is a term coming from good old Magic the Gathering. I think the first card over there was called Millstone. It was an artifact for two that you had to pay. You could pay two once a turn and tap it. Yes, back there you could tap things, not exhaust them. And the opponent milled, which means put the top two cards from their deck to their graveyard, so from their deck to their void in terms of eternal. <clears throat> so here we don't have any such relics, and honestly uh, there are uh, the things that can mill the opponent in eternal card game are few and far between, but I, nonetheless I have been trying for the past month or so to make a mill deck, make a working mill deck that's at least tier 2, so at least maybe playable. Uh, my first attempts were back in Season 4 with uh, Fall of Argentport and Into uh, the Shadows campaign. When they were out, I was playing a Xenon Mask of Torment deck that focused on life stealing and life force abilities. And uh, at a particular moment while playing that, that deck was running a card that is called Dream Snatcher. It's a 2 cost 2-3 uh, for Shadow Shadow Influence with Life Steal, which is quite good, and says uh, and has also two abilities. The first one, whenever the enemy player discards a non-power card, this unit gets plus one attack permanently. And by discards a non-power card, it means either discards from their hand or discards from their deck to the void, because discarding from the deck is also called discarding. And the second part of uh, the second ability here is an ultimate one, pay 10, wow, that's a lot. Pay 10 to make the enemy player discard the top 15 cards of their deck to the void, to the void, to the void, and 12 times more to the void. So back then I was running four of these, and then at one point or another, I saw another card, because I didn't know a lot of cards back then, that is called Solitude. It's a legendary spell uh, for 6 power with Shadow Shadow Influence that says the enemy player discards the top card of their deck for each card in their void, which means the more stuff they already have milled, uh, the more they are going to get milled by Solitude. So I put one of these Solitudes in the market and managed to mill opponents a couple of times. Milling in this game um, is a bit similar to how it works in Magic the Gathering. So here, uh, when you want to win with your opponent by milling them, it means when their deck is down to zero cards, they have everything played out already or in their void or in their hand or in play. Uh, wait, I said play twice. Oh, never mind. So when they don't have any cards in their deck, they lose the game at the end of the turn. So if you mill them during your turn, they die at the end of your turn. If they draw their last cards during their turn, they still have a couple of things to do uh, to win. Otherwise, they're going to lose at the end of their turn. So um, this is the basis of the deck. Okay, so uh, generally, the mill strategy has been uh, quite weak, usually. I mean, there is a, a Stone Scar card called Black Iron Manacles that deals the opponent one damage 
for each card I think it was they drew or put in their void. Mm, let me double check. There's a card called Black Iron Manacles that says at the end of each turn deal one damage to the cursed player, which means the opponent usually, for each card that player drew or discarded this turn. Also discarded from their deck to their void. Alright, so that's another take that is possible, another take on the mill deck, but that's more aggressive milling than milling per se. And I wanted to focus on the, on the proper milling of the opponents. So when set 5 came out, there was an inclusion of a new card from that set that is called Mournful Death Cap. It's a two-cost uh, Shadow Shadow Influence 0 for Sporefolk, and there's not many Sporefolk uh, in the current metagame, or in the current format at least, in, in all the expansions. That is the ability Empower, which means each time you put a power card into play, the enemy player discards the top three cards of their deck. So this is a good early drop to both block the opponent's 1-1s, uh, 2-2s, 3-3s, etc. and to progress the milling of the opponent until you can uh, launch a big solitude or two on them. Um, so these two cards alongside the Dream Snatcher uh, are the cornerstones of milling the opponent. Uh, let me go now through the cards. So I already talked about the main strategies here. So now I'm gonna go through the cards themselves. Okay, so Dream Snatcher uh, I've already discussed this card, is a uh, is a very good early game stopper against aggressive decks and is also very good for uh, putting a buffer on your life total against control matches. Uh, Combo swell with Mournful Death Cap, because remember, each time you mill the opponent for a card and it's a non-power card, Dream Snatcher gets bigger. So, uh, if you have an opening, of Dream Snatcher and Mournful Death Cap, obviously to Shadow Power. My suggested start of the game is on turn two, play Dream Snatcher. On turn three, play Mournful Death Cap, play a power, mill the opponent for three, possibly non power cards, so that the Dream Snatcher can be bigger when it attacks on turn three. So it's a first tip of the game. Uh, next up we have Current and Merchant, so currently there is the choice of either playing Time Merchant, Shadow Merchant or the Xenon Smuggler, but I wanted to have as many Solitudes in this deck as possible, so I wanted Merchants, and Solitude is a Shadow card, so obviously the Shadow Merchant is where we're at. Uh, I will talk about the market in a moment. Next up there is an Inclusion of some Nightfall synergies. Uh, so we have here Lunar Magus for three power and time time influence. It's a three four unit that when you play it, turns night on. And when you start your turn at night, you gain four life. And when you start your turn at night, uh, sorry, well, maybe I'll talk about Nightfall first. So Nightfall means uh, when you start a turn at night, draw an additional card and take one damage. And when you uh, play something with Nightfall, uh, it, uh, night, the night condition on the game starts, <clears throat> continues through the opponent's turn, and back throughout your next turn, till the end of it. So uh, when you play a unit such as this or a card that generates Nightfall, it means that uh, the game screen will get darker for a moment. Uh, maybe some crows will fly over the, the game board. And uh, uh, when you end your turn, the opponent will draw an additional card and take one point of damage. And then when it comes back to you, you will be dealt one point of damage and draw an additional card. But remember that, that dealing one damage and gaining life from Lunar Magus happen at the same time. So if it's night, you're at one point of health and you have Lunar Magus in play, you won't die. You will reset yourself to four points of health. Uh, so this card here serves three purposes or two purposes. We'll get to how many in a moment. So first of all, uh, it's a good body, which means good stats. Three, four, four, three. It's good to stopping some aggro, for example, whirling duels, three, three with charge and lifesteal for three. 
uh, it uh, makes it knight, which means it both draws you an additional card and kind of mills your opponent for one, which means they have one fewer card in, in their deck. And it also can uh, bu buff your life total. So three cheers for Lunar Magus. Next up, when it comes to Nightfall, here we have Duskwalker. It's also a big buddy radiant for four power. We have Time Shadow Influence, it's a 4-4. Four four. When you summon it, triggers Knight also, and you have plus two maximum power at night, which means if you have this in play and start your turn at night, you have two more power to spend for playing your stuff, which is usually good for putting more units in play or for killing the opposing units the opponent has in play. Uh, next up, the Beal and all of, four, of Shadow Four Drops, uh, Baby Vara or Vara Vengeance Seeker, four power with Shadow Shadow Influence for a three four, Hero Sign, uh, Life Steal. Nothing can have Aegis, which has its uses obviously. And when you summon it, summon it when you play it, the enemy player must choose. They either sacrifice one of their units in play, or Vara gets plus two plus two and deadly, which means you either play it uh, as a three four and the opponent loses a unit. Uh, or you play it as a 5-6 with Deadly and Lifesteal, obviously. So, bonkers. Obviously, when mm, this buff is permanent, so when it is Deadly and you then return it from your Void via Dark Return or something like that, it still stays Deadly. So it's a good cornerstone of the deck. I'm only playing three of these, because unfortunately having eight four drops was a bit too much for this deck, and I have been stuck with four drops time and time again, or... Time and Shadow again, uh, unable to play them. Next up, we have the Bear of a Behemoth, a World Bearer Behemoth, for 5 power and 3 time influence. And this time influence requirement is unfortunately a doozy for this deck, so currently I'm not sure if I will continue playing this card, but so far it has been performing quite nice when I was able to play it, obviously. It has Overwhelm, and also, when this attacks, you play one random power card from your deck, then increase this ability by one, which means the next turn, time it attacks, it attacks for uh, it attacks and gives you two power cards from your deck. And this card has an amazing set line: six, seven, overwhelm for five. That's like bonkers. Uh, also, all this uh, getting you additional power helps you play more cards, obviously, helps you trigger your Mournful Death Caps and later on Mystic Ascendance, and also puts you that much closer to the ultimate ability of Dream Snatcher of <clears throat> milling the opponent for 15. So all in all, very good, uh, must kill. So uh, the so-called must kill. And last but not least in the unit category, we have Mystic Ascendant. So this is a six cost with one time influence Mystic. That is a four, four that has a very, maybe even a unique ability uh, that has Empower, which means, once again, when each time you play a power card, this has plus two, plus two, and you get to draw a card. So, from my experience, usually, it's best to play this card when you can follow it up with, draw, with playing a power and drawing a card, which means redrawing that power. So, the best scenario of curving out Mystic Ascendant in this deck is obviously playing Duskwalker on turn 4, then beginning your next turn with 4 plus 2, i.e. 6 power, playing Mystic Ascendant on turn 5 for 6, then playing a power, having this as a 6-6 six, six, and redrawing a card for that power you have played. Obviously, when you already have your World Bearer Behemoth in play and want to attack with it, first why not play a Mystic Ascendant and then attack with the Behemoth and then trigger this ability so also draws a card, etc, etc. Um, prior to this decklist, I have been playing with three Mystic Ascendants, but I took one out to try out this Xenon Temple. That's a side. That's uh, the newest card type that came with the new set, def the last set, Defiance. That is a five cost with an enormous requirement of Time Time Shadow Shadow. Has three durability. And uh, the ongoing ability says when an enemy unit dies, steal it and put it into your void. Enemy units dying mean they are uh, getting, they are discarded from, from play, they are killed from play. It does not mean when you, the opponent is milling stuff from their deck. 
So this card is the only non-bow or non-combo with milling the opponent, because when you have it in play and you keep destroying enemies' units, they don't go into the void and they don't feed your solitude later on. So that's that's the only non-bow, but sides are still good and this card shines uh, at its best. When you play it, you get to play one of the three agenda spells, and on each of your following turns, while this is in play, you get to play the remaining ones, and on the fourth turn, when it if it is still in play, you get you get to play the unit that's on the bottom there, a big 8-8 world joiner. <clears throat> so these three cards. Usually when you play it, you either go for Xenon Initiation, which means uh, give one of your units plus one, plus one, and killer. And remember, if you put it on a deadly unit, this Xenon Initiation, if you put killer on a deadly unit, it can destroy any unit the opponent has in play, given that they don't kill your unit before. And if you put it, for example, on your World Bearer Behemoth, this triggering killer also triggers its ability of playing power from your deck, getting it into play. Uh, also, please remember that you can trigger the killer ability even if you just played a unit on the current turn. So doesn't have summoning sickness or anything like that. Uh, the other option that is uh, also most uh, quite common, is playing Xenon Augury. Draw one of the top three cards of your deck, put the rest on the bottom, and you gain three life. So you kind of redraw a card from the top three cards of your deck. Scare, swapping a unit's attack and health, is not usually played, well, maybe on the occasional uh, Aurelian Merchant, maybe. Sometimes uh, when you have to play Scare and it uh, doesn't allow you to play suffocate on an opposing unit that could hurt, but you more often than not this scare does nothing and the world joiner is just a big unit that is an additional option of uh, ending the game in an aggro fashion, aggressive fashion. <clears throat> now let's get to spells. So first up we have only two dark returns. This is for one power with one shadow influence, a spell, Draw a unit from your void and it gets plus one plus one. So I, I, been, I am playing only two of these because if you draw a lot of them early game it just clogs your hand but later you have your choice of either getting a mournful death cap or a big fara or already triggered world bear behemoth or a unit that already got killer uh, or something with uh, nightfall to redraw your cards or later in the game if you have the ultimate for the dream snatcher you go right ahead with that etc etc. Next up, we have a very big uh, death and destruction suite of, uh, of some removal spells. So here we have three suffocates, and I have included this card in the latest uh, versions of the deck, because uh, you don't want to die to early aggression, so you need some cheap removal that you can remove an opposing unit for one and play one of your units as well. So this one, as a slow spell, kills a unit with three attack or less, and you usually can kill at least a merchant or a smuggler, and those are in almost all of the decks. Next up, a fast spell called Annihilate, one of the best removals, usually. Uh, that is uh, for two power and a single shadow requirement, kill a unit with a single faction. Also remember that it doesn't kill units with no faction like Kyphus or Momentum Builder or the Strangers. The All this comes more in draft the Fixing Strangers. Next up we have Four of Banish. It's also a fast spell for three power this time, with a time and shadow influence requirement, and it kills an enemy unit or relic with cost four or less. Remember, this, also, this doesn't uh, destroy any attachments like permafrost on your units, and it can destroy enemy cursed relics such as disciplinary weights you can get from a teacher, or an Avigraft even. And instant destruction and an Avigraft uh, leads to very good defensive plays as I've plays as I've seen time and time again. Next up, I'm a, I am running at a very high total of three in Cold Bloods. This is a spell for four, uh, costing four for double shadow requirement that says kill an enemy unit if it was if it had just this requirement, the enemy player discards each copy from their hand and deck, they can't leave the void, and you lose all justice influence. So you can't play it 
usually, unless you're a, you don't like your justice influence. Uh, so you don't want to play it in an Argent Port or Argent Port based deck. So in Cold Blood, uh, this has a couple of uh, upsides. First of all, mm, currently there are many decks that are running Justice or multi-faction unit that have Justice, like all the Rakano aggro decks, all the Argent Port decks, all the Winchess decks. Uh, on the other side, even if it only kills a unit at slow speed, I mean kills any unit at slow speed, uh, like a big uh, Heart of the Vault, or Joe, or anything else. Uh, it's just one power more expensive than Slay, which is still okay. But the ability of shutting down some uh, justice-based units from the opponent's deck, and it also kind of mills them for three as well. Uh, for three, or makes them discard cards from their hand. So this is more like a metagame call. So, for example, if the metagame is full of Gen F Peaks or something like that, this is might be a bit worse, I mean the second ability, but it is still kill an enemy unit, and you still need those. And last, and certainly not least, we have the cornerstone of this deck, and the corner office stone, but this corner office is unfortunately four of bars both on the doors and the windows. So this card that I've already mentioned, Solitude, is a six power spell with double shadow requirement that says the enemy player discards the top card of their deck for each card in their void. So everything you kill, everything they discard on their own, every spell they play, everything you mill, they, it is already building up this solitude, and there is usually a small green uh, green number here when you're playing this uh, this card that uh, helps you and says how many cards the opponent already has in their void, or you can just hover over uh, to their void and see how many cards they have there. Also, if you uh, there is a quick solitude count, so if you have a solitude and a mournful death cap and you want to math out if you're able to mill the opponent or not, remember, then the death cap mills twice. It's so it, first it mills three cards, and then your solitude mills three additional cards. So it's if you want to count it, for example, if the opponent has 20 cards in their void, and you have a mournful death cap in play and a solitude in hand, you know you can mill the opponent for 26 cards this turn when you play a power. So if you play a power, mill three cards, the opponent now has 23 cards in their void, and when you play Solitude, it mills them for 23 more cards, so 3 plus 23, so it's uh, 26 with 20 cards already in their void, 46, so this means the opponent is almost already milled out. Another quick math reference, if you have double Solitude in your hand, you just count, uh, you just get the number you have in the bottom corner and multiply it by three. So for example, if it says the opponent has 17 cards in their void, which is usually a number I see on this card, uh, you the first one would mill the opponent for those 17 cards, which means 17 plus 17 is 34. So the second one mills them for 34. So the amount for, from the first and the amount they already have. So it's x plus 2x, which means 3x, which means you just multiply it by three. Hope I didn't over convolute it. Next up, we have the power base. So it is the usual, given that we are uh, influence requirements are double shadow on turn two, double time on turn three, and triple time on turn five. We need many, many, many a card that gives us double influence. So we have the full amounts of crests, seats, and banners. Uh, but please, Always, always, always remember which are which, which, which come into play depleted, which come into play ready. Because uh, it happened to me on more than one occasion that I've played a banner when I thought I had a seat or the other way around. Also, you have 11 sigils, 5 time sigils and 6 shadow sigils for triggering those seats. And you have 4 amethyst waystones that... <clears throat> These are the, the Shadow Waystones that you gain Shadow Influence and don't come into play depleted, but they don't trigger themselves for the seats. And after you play it, <clears throat> if you have at least four Shadow Influence, Nightfall, which means it triggers Lunar Magus, it triggers Duskwalker, and it draws you a card, draws the opponent a card, etc., etc. But also remember, it deals damage to the opponents. And I was able to win 
with one of the opponents, at least one of my opponents, with that last nightfall damage. And it's very satisfying indeed. Okay, next up we have a section called the Market. Uh, that is full of uh, five shadow cards from our current and merchants and it has Devastating Setback. This is a good card uh, usually against uh, Praxis tokens and cleaning up some aggro boards. Remember when you have six power you can merchant for it and play it but your merchant dies. Uh, on the other hand the rest of your units survive through it. So this has two modes, either the one I've already talked to you uh, about, each unit in play gets minus two minus two this turn, only this turn, or the enemy player discards a spell or attachment of your choice from their hand. So this is also a card you can catch while playing against a control deck. So this is a more expensive sabotage with a modal, something like that. I have thought about exchanging this card for an extract Uh, I was thinking about exchanging this card for an extract that is a three cost double shadow spell with lifesteal, deal three damage to anything, and scout. So this deal three damage was mostly to kill sites. So this is also a possible addition to your market if you're encountering a lot of sites. Not the Gen of Peaks or Dizzo's office, but it can kill the rest of them. Second card in the market is the fourth copy of In Cold Blood, because you just usually need a removal in there. Third card is called Burglarize. It's a four-cost uh, spell with double shadow requirement. Nightfall. And also steal an enemy relic and put it in your hand. So uh, first, when I was playing this deck, I thought I don't need Burglarize, so I already have four banishes in my deck, so I can get rid of Avigraphs, combustion cells, disciplinary weights, etc, etc. But there are a couple of cards that this can't get rid of, and the biggest and the baddest of them all is Martyr's Chains. So when you're playing against a chain deck, you can just steal it from your opponent, play it, you already have some empower synergies, and you just run wild with it. Next up, Xenon Temple. Already talked about it, so this is usually from my opinion at least, uh, when you are playing mid-range slash control decks like this one, you need a, a proactive four or five drop that you can always get from the merchant if you don't need anything else. Because this market is usually reactive. Uh, so if the opponent is going wide, you go for devastating setback. If the opponent has a big green unit, you go for in cold blood. If the opponent is playing relics, get burglarize. Uh, if you're already winning, you get solitude. But if the board state is neutral and you're ahead, or maybe not ahead, but you just want a card that gives you some kind of an advantage, you go for the temple. Also remember that this, this acts like removal because it can get you Xenon initiation on the merchant that you already gotten this with. And last but not least in the market is the fourth copy of Solitude, so at least right now you're playing four to seven copies of Solitude. Four to seven copies of Solitude because you can count each merchant kind of as a Solitude. Also remember that if you're exchanging cards with a merchant and you can put a Shadow Sigil or a Time Sigil from your hand into your market, and you have all your requirements in play already, which means three time and four shadow, put a shadow sigil in there, because there is always a chance of you needing to get that back from the market with an additional merchant. Also, earlier in the game, when you have a merchant and you have a solitude in hand, you can safely put the solitude back in the market, because you, you not only have four merchants, you can still all, also dark return them, get them back in your hand, get one solitude, then in a couple of moments you can get the other solitude. So this deck, when you mill someone, you usually need... It's obviously very good to have at least one death cap early on and trigger it at least a couple of times. Uh, but usually the game ends with a solitude or a double solitude. Also, if you have a Dream Snatcher in play, don't be afraid to play a small to medium-sized Solitude against an aggressive deck, 
just to mill the opponent for some cards, just to be able to regain that much more health with uh, Dream Snatcher's Lifesteal attack. So this is a deck that I have been playing for the last couple of weeks. I have played it in the ECQ last weekend, in the Eternal Championship Qualifier, to a almost satisfactory 17 wins, 11 losses. I was two wins away from getting into top 64, and my ending place was number 113th. Okay, so that's it for the theory. Now, let's head over to the games. Also, thank you for listening. This was Kalibovich.